Okay, let's talk about our patient today. Our patient today is a dentist. Young lady, a preeminent lecturer. The dental hygienist from Bulgaria. Buffalo, New York. Atlanta, Oklahoma, Vancouver, Canada, Boston, Kansas City, San Francisco, Montreal, Munich, Germany, London, and Santa Maria, California. Now we're going to place 14 lumineers, 8 lumineers, 10 lumineers, 6 lumineers, 10, 2, 8, 8, 10, 10, 8, 10, 8 lumineers today on our patient. And now we're not treating teeth anymore. We're treating smiles. Isn't that beautiful? So let's look at the transformation from where we started and where we are. Our patient today is an example of that. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the live webcast of placing uh, serenade lumineers on a patient who would like to improve your smile. Before you get started, if you've never done a lumineer case before, you want to go through the DVDs that we have, you and your staff, two or three times in separate days. We go, and Lisa has everything in place. She's been with me for almost 20 years. And that's the placement kit. Okay, let's take a look at what Lisa's done over here. That looks uh, like there's a lot of stuff there, but really, if you put circles around it, there's only four or five groups of tools. And these little pieces of porcelain, Lisa has put porcelain conditioner on the veneers, which is a citric acid, and then she's put serenade prime on the uh, porcelain. About half the time I get by without doing any trimming uh, at all, and the other half the time I do a little to quite a lot of cosmetic chlorine. Contouring, always governed by no anesthetic is required nor desired. Because if I give up that awareness of where the sensory system is, and if I'm grinding on the wrong type tissue, I won't know if the patient's numb. Okay, before I became a dentist, I became an optometrist. So I know something about the eyes. And four powers which you need to work with. So when you have that amount of magnification, you can avoid those sensitive areas. Uh, I'm going to place nine veneers on her in less than one minute because I have this plasma arc light. And, and it's very important because you've heard stories about porcelain veneers popping off. Well, they made the porcelain thick, they're bonding to dentin, and then they have this weak light and they don't take long enough and they don't convert the monomer to polymer. So they pop off. Okay, we're going to use Ultrabond today. And uh, Ultrabond matches up with the porcelain and with the tooth. And it's been around for 20 some odd years. You won't get micro leakage when you're using Ultrabond, Serenade Porcelain and Tooth Structure with 10 year AB, okay? Okay, the last little uh, tip I have for you is take a good impression. So what's new? We like to use the double wash Invisalign technique. We use Lumineer's impression material. We never, never retract tissue, why? Because before we started and before we took our impressions, what do we have? We had a patient that's free from caries. We had a patient that has the perio controlled. And we had a patient that had the occlusion equilibrated. Lisa's polished her teeth with porcelain polishing paste because it has uh, papain in there. And we use that to dissolve the plaque on the tooth. You know, plaque is really just grease. And an enzyme is a detergent. So we get rid of that. And then when we etch the teeth and prepare the surface, I'm going to apply some Paynon Dental Dam. <clears throat> so, uh, Paynon Dental Dam is what we use to uh, isolate the teeth when doing chair-side bleaching. Only there we usually put it on the labial surface, but today I'm going to put it on the lingual surface and apply it to any area that I don't want the Ultra Bond to stick to on the lingual side. So it facilitates cleanup. And one of the things we have to be very careful about is not having the pain on dental dam go from the lingual of the teeth and go through to the labial because that'll prevent seating of the veneer, the lumineer. And so we apply it all over the surface. It takes about two minutes to do this, but it really does facilitate cleanup on the finishing. And somebody's going to say, well, 
why didn't you put matrices between the teeth and why didn't you half cure it and make it easier to get all that done and I say well because I don't like to disturb these pieces of porcelain once I place them I just take the light for three seconds place it and the best way to protect your eyes is to close them and that's what it looks on the lingual side Now I'm using etch and seal, which is 25% phosphoric acid, medium viscosity, and it contains aluminum oxalate. So when you're using it on your regular operative procedures, uh, say like you want to etch your enamel margins and you get some on the dentin, the aluminum oxalate will seal the tubules and help prevent sensitivity. Uh, I like to use a medium viscosity because this way I control my etching aid and I just push it around where I want it to be. You know, etching was first discovered back in 1955. Two young dentists by the name of Gwinnett and Bonacor wrote an article in a professional journal describing the technique of etching teeth. And then another dentist by the name of Bowen came along and he developed composites, he developed the air rotor, at the uh, National Institute. He's just a very quiet genius that hardly anybody knows his name. But he developed tenure, this dentin bonding system. So we call it Bowen's Resin. And he came to me at a dental meeting and he said, you know, Bob, I've got this great dentin bonding system, but it has nine steps. And he said, nobody wants it. I said, well, if it's really that good, what difference does it make how many steps? So we took out a license had the chemist look at it and got it down to two bottles and one step. So this is Bowen's dentin bonding system and you have had a lot of dentin bonding systems presented to you. These manufacturers have to have a new story for you about every six months so that you'll buy new and be on the cutting edge of change. But nobody has improved and done a better job on tenure than Bowen, and, than Bowen has done. It's independent of light curing. It'll bond to any system. Sometimes they talk about six and seven generation bonding systems, and I, I think these guys are kind of hokey. You know, I never heard of a generation in my chemistry book. I just heard about things that were chemically correct or incorrect. We didn't use any adjectives on the chemical courses I took. So, You'll find this is fail safe. I've been using it and I tried the others and sometimes they worked and sometimes they didn't. Okay. Let's see what we got here. Left central. We always call out the name of the tooth. Now when you have a diastema like that you have to be careful that those wings don't go over the undercuts because if you push them down what you can cause the porcelain to crack. So you need to have that open margin. And you guys have all been taught to have closed margins. Now the first thing I want to show you is these are the same shade luminaire. But they don't look the same. Why? Well, when light goes through a medium, it continues going forward until it exceeds what they call a critical angle. So when you have the etched veneer on the tooth with no try-in paste, you're looking at the critical angle being the etched surface of the veneer. Whereas when we put the Ultrabond try-in paste in, this is going to show you what it's going to look like when it picks up the color of the tooth to add to it. So uh, that's a very important thing to remember. And the Ultrabond try-in paste is exactly the same material as Ultrabond, except it doesn't have any activators in it. Now we're going to give the patient a choice. And I don't like to let patients look at all of their teeth 
especially if they have attractive teeth and she's in pretty good shape that way because they never look good compared to the way they will look after you install them. Now we're going to get a mirror and you get to look at the tooth on the left or the tooth on the right. Now the tooth on the right has Supreme White and the tooth on the left has B0. Okay. The right. The right one. Okay. So this is all I let the patient do and that's all you should let them do is that she had a chance to participate in the selection of the shade and to be really candid about it. Either shade would have looked beautiful on her. But if you're doing one or two or three teeth, you're going to spend a lot of time working with that. Now remember this Ultrabon Tri-End paste doesn't have any activator in it. So we have to clean it off the surface. And we're going to use a material called Tenure S. And we're going to wipe all of this Ultrabond Tri-End paste off. Lisa's using it on the inside of the lumineers. And I think we're going to take on those darker teeth there and add a little bit of enamel shade Tetra Pig, Lisa. Not a lot. And I'm putting this all over the surface because this is a HEMA formula. And once you prepare the surface, a race begins between contamination and resin. So I want to get this on the surface as soon as I can and blow the excess off because if I don't, it's going to set. And we're going to take a little bit of enamel shade Tetra Pig. And that really does block things out in a brush. And I'm going to brush this around so it's not too thick. And I want to kind of bring the value up to about what the other teeth look like. Now I have to tell you, the two critical things that you're going to have to do with luminaires or with anything really when you're doing cosmetic dentistry is shade matching and occlusion. Now, right central. So I'm using a thing called a Lumigrip. This was developed by a dentist by the name of Irving Meeker down in Pasadena. And Irving spent countless hours working on this and working on various iterations. There we go. And we're just going to start placing these. It works off the suction on your chair. And I just get it close, picks it up. Don't have to touch it. Left, right lateral. You kind of... Switching on me today. Yeah, okay. I'm adaptable. <laughs> see how that picks it up? Can you see it? There, okay. And then I'll just get this on the cuspid. Now remember, I've tried these in. I made sure that they're going to seat loosely. And I just push them to place with the let me grip. And we're only doing the first buy on the right side. Is that correct? Hmm? Yes. Okay. Very good. See, this is when you're going down the runway. When I was younger and our children were smaller, anyway. We used to fly all over the country, and I had to tell the children to be very quiet while Daddy's going down the runway. That and landing were really critical times. They couldn't fool around then. So now we're going down the runway. And if you've done your pre-flight just right, or your pre-placement procedures just right, I don't know if any of you think you can handle this. This takes a lot of dexterity and many years of clinical skill to get these line angles just right underneath this resin. That's kind of a joke in case you didn't understand. See, I come back from the days of gold foil. And uh, not everybody could do a good gold foil. So, you know, you just want to be the best of the best. And the more tooth structure you took off and the better impressions and and I'm just taking most of this off. And we're going to take a two millimeter tip here on the light. 
go around and I've taken a lot of the excess off. And some dentists will say, well, why didn't you clean that a little bit more before you finished it? And I say, well, I used to do that. And once in a while I displaced unknowingly a uh, veneer. And that wasn't a good day. So now I take the two millimeter tip. I go for one second on each luminaire to spot cure it so it won't go running all over the place. Close your eyes. And stabilize it, and I see resin ooze out around the margins. If you don't see as resin ooze out around the margins, you've got one of two things. Just the right amount or not quite enough. They all look the same. So... Now, I like to come from the lingual side and make sure that I've got the ultra bond sealing these margins. Because you have space between the porcelain and the tooth, and you're going to fill it all in with the ultra bond because once it's cured, it becomes one homogeneous mass. And what I'm doing is just wiping off the unset material on the lingual side. And I found some margins that would have been open had I not done this. See how that looks? Now we're going to take a cotton roll with tenure S on it. And we'll wipe off some more of the unset resin that wasn't set by that two millimeter tip for one second. But see, these are fixed in place. And you don't want them sliding around. Okay, and that sort of cleans it up. So now we're going to take the 9 millimeter tip for 5 seconds on each tooth. That's uh, 9 teeth, 5 seconds per tooth. I hold it about a millimeter off the tooth. And that's less than a minute, isn't it? I think occlusion and color are your two most critical factors in doing luminaires, but that's probably true in other aspects of dentistry too. Now, if I didn't have the materials to serve me, I couldn't do this. I'm using a Sure 349, and we'll start taking off the paint on dental dam. Almost any instrument works on taking off the paint on dental dam, but when you're cleaning up the labial surface, uh, the Sure 349 is a very important instrument because it won't scratch the porcelain. So I'm just lifting this up. Let's take a look on the lingual side. Notice how nice those gingival margins are. They're all cleaned up for me now. Anything, I'm using this uh, American football shaped diamond. And I start blending all the Ultra Bond, all the porcelain, and all the enamel together. And I just take away anything that I don't like looking at. So I now have one biomimetric homogeneous mass that I'm contouring.
and we'll begin with one of two things. I guess I'll begin with the 12 fluted burr. So now all I'm doing, and this is where bore power magnification is critical. I'm just going around all the margins of the porcelain and I can see it perfectly. Uh, I don't work on the labial surface. And a good way to practice for doing this procedure is put your four power magnification on and then if you've got some children that have coloring books or grandchildren with coloring books practice coloring and staying within the lines. Sometimes you can show them a veneer technique that's taught by some clinicians showing how much tooth structure they remove and how much anesthetic they have to give so they don't feel it. See, we're doing all this without anesthetic. It's a relaxed environment. Okay, now I'm going to take this Sure 349 instrument. It's an orthodontic band seating instrument and you will never scratch the porcelain with this. However, don't ever use your hygienist scaling instrument because that will really scratch the porcelain. Nice thing about Serenade porcelain is if I don't like the shape, the contour, I can modify it after it's bonded because it's carvable. Uh, you can carve it and repolish it real easy. And it wears like enamel. And I've just got a moist gauze now, wiping off the excess. And a lot of dentists think they're finished at this stage. And that's what I want to impress upon you, that you're not. And well... Here she was about 40 minutes ago. Here she is now. Now this is where you really begin the finishing because you're going to get the emergence profiles blended. You're going to open the interproximal embrasures. So now I'm going to take an ultra fine long narrow diamond because you have total control. And you'll see when I do this, there's minimal bleeding, if any. You know, sometimes you may wonder if I'm really serious when we have kind of a jovial attitude around here. But you know what it's like when you're getting ready to do the big procedure in your dental office for a root canal or a crown. And this is a procedure that both the dentist and the patient can engage in levity because they're both happy that the patient doesn't feel any pain and is getting a dramatic change in their appearance. Now, her teeth really weren't bad. I'll show you some that are bad. And it doesn't take any longer to do a case like that. Why? See what I'm doing is I'm checking these margins, making sure I've got them sort of blended. And I never get it all done on the placement visit. I used to try to get everything finished and I'd spend two, three hours trying to get every last little tidbit out of there. And then when I would have to come back a few days later or a week later, no matter how I tried, I always miss something. So now we're going to go on the lingual side with this long narrow diamond and open these embrasures some more. Good. 
And then on the left side, I can usually get direct vision. And that way, when I take the seri saw to go up there, it follows the pathways created by the diamond. Let me get a little bit in here. So we just take and dry the teeth. And what shade do we use on her? B0. B0? Okay, not close. Now let's see what we've got in here. Although, let's see what we've got in here. All of the marks in her mouth are on natural tooth structure. I don't want her leaving here with centric prematurities. I'm using a uh, Siri saw, and this was developed by a dentist by the name of Harvey Putter. So sometimes they call it the Putter Cutter in honor of Dr. Harvey Putter. And I use a lot of torque. See how that goes through? If I meet resistance, then I don't saw, I rock. And then if I still meet resistance, then I do a little bit of it. There it is. Now that was kind of resistant. That's a lot of pressure, isn't it? That was kind of nice to up till now, wasn't I? And, and uh, this way, you open all the easy ones. And the ones that aren't easy to open, you have them back on the next visit. Now, if one of these was a porcelain veneer bonding to a porcelain crown, I wouldn't try to open the contact on that visit. It takes about 24 hours to get that silenated bond just right, because when I have put force on them too soon, pop off. Now we're going to take a seri sander, and this is just an orthodontic piece of stainless steel that's impregnated with diamond abrasive, and the question is, would it ever uh, open the contacts too much? And so far, you know, I don't sit here for a half hour doing this, but it makes it here. Let's 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 show them how easy that is to run the floss through there now. See that? Did I speak too soon? Yeah. <laughs> okay. See. So you're just running it down, and then you bring it back, and you're out. So we opened it. Now, I'm going to do that to all of her teeth, but not while you're watching me, because that'll be very boring. What is the Hugger Bridge? It's for places where you've got space and enamel on either side, and you make a fixed bridge out of it. So let's show them what the Hugger Bridge looks like. So here we go. Now this little matrix on here is, we just started doing this, is to hold the bonding resin within those clasps and I will seat it in the patient's mouth. So I haven't tried this in yet and I wasn't even thinking about doing this but everything has gone so well. See? Now we're going to bond it, take off the excess. Now where do you use this? Well, your first option is, I believe, to do everything in cast gold, three-quarter crowns. And your second option is implants. You use it as a provisional. And so if you're waiting for interosseous healing, you can put this over the site instead of a mucoadhesion partial. Now, people ask me how long they're going to last. If the occlusion is adjusted correctly, I have ha yet to have one fail. So the longest one I've had in so far is five years. And we're etching that just like we did. And then we use a cotton roll next. Okay. And sometimes it doesn't hurt to have a second assistant here. Okay. And we'll put tenure around there and tenure S. See, just like we did on surface preparation for the porcelain. 
I don't think you knew you were going to get this today, did you? I didn't tell you because I wasn't sure I was going to do it. Just a little bonus. And he put three or four coats of Bowen's resin on there, 10 year AB. Now we're going to put 10 year S on there. So here we are. See, this little matrix really makes a big difference. I'm just starting to use this. So I can put this in her mouth. And I used to try to do it with my fingers, and it would run off the wings and everything, and you wouldn't get it all in. So now, by having this matrix there, it keeps the resin in place. And let me see what we got here. Take the brush and take this off. And you want to see a little excess all over in there, which we have. Now Lisa's going to take the light and put it on the buckle to help fix it. Uh, give it two seconds on the five millimeter tip. Yeah, you can do it two or three times, but don't look at it. And the big trick here is to get that bonded and hold it stable until the cement sets. Because you don't want it wobbling around and then it comes out. But the nice thing is if they come off, it's no big deal to put them back in. Now let's see if you got to uh, try a little explorer there and see if you got that seated enough. Want to try a little bit more light in there? Now I just pop this off here and okay. You're just blending the resin with the tooth. You see with the tenure S, what you didn't cure with the light got cured with the tenure S. Now, a dentist told me about a problem we had with the Hugger Bridge. He had placed an implant, and then they put the Hugger Bridge over the implant while I was doing osseous integration. And the patient liked the Hugger Bridge so well, he said, why do I have to have the implant? Of course, it was already there. So then they were left with the dilemma, how long are you going to leave the implant in with nothing on it? And why did you put it there in the first place? So those can be challenging situations. And right now, if I didn't have four power magnification, this would be really virtually an impossible situation. And I'll let you take a look at it here in a minute. And okay, let's see if we can get back here on the distal. Wide. You okay? Okay, so once again, this is the critical part of it, getting it bonded and then checking the occlusion. Close. And I just explained to patients that these are provisionals. They're better than the space.
most of the time. Okay, let's see what it looks like here on that. So we got a little heavy marks back there on the, see if we can get that second molar back there. There's some distal marks on the distal of that wing and on the bicuspid. Now clean up the rough stuff. And wide. And I got a heavy mark over here on the resin, so I'll take that off with my football shaped diamond and get that to blend in. And I'm using direct vision here, I'm about 15 inches from the surface of the tooth. And with that four power magnification, it really facilitates cleanup or finishing, whatever you want to call it. And in this case, we even got a pretty good color match with the uh, porcelain veneers. Although it's pretty far back on the second bicuspid. And I just blend this. And so let's let you take a look at that. And I'm probably going to spend a half hour trimming off the excess on their next visit. Anyhow, if you ever want to get in touch with me or come out here to uh, California, why, uh, just drop in and visit and say hello. If you ever have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me by email. And uh, have a nice evening, and we're going to have a nice day. Okay, see you guys. I, I never thought that my smile was that bad. I, I was okay with my smile, and I had tried bleaching my two front teeth before, but nothing had really worked. And when the opportunity arose, and I started seeing all the change in the smiles and the wall of fame here at Dead Mat, it just amazed me how much better my smile could be. Even though it wasn't bad, it was just, it could be that much dramatically changed. And the diastema, that was huge. To fill in the gap, oh, it's just amazing. I wouldn't have never gone in for a traditional implant. I was expected to have a hole in my mouth the rest of my life. I never thought. I, I figured the other tooth would probably grow into the space. And, uh, but I wouldn't have gone to the dentist unless it caused me pain. But uh, thank goodness for Denmat because the Hugger Bridge is just amazing. It, it filled the hole instantly. It feels natural. I can't even t really tell it's there. It's, um, I, I'm just so happy with it. it it was very quick. I did not even realize I was in the chair that long. It was fun. I, we joked during the whole procedure. It was, I mean, it was absolutely no pain. The fact that they won't stain and discolor like normal enamel does is huge. And most people, as soon as you get older, your teeth get darker and to have a perfect white smile is, at almost 39 years old, is amazing. And this was the first time I chose not in pain with perfect teeth to have something cosmetically done that just has, is going to change my life. I really feel it. <laughs>